I hope so. We hope so. <laughs> yeah, we're looking for new possibilities. But I started in a, in a few minutes, I will start and do it in English. Okay. I have a few people already show, showing up. I see. I see Mark Alsmeyer. I see, uh, I see uh, Mark, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the audio is on Mark and hear me. Yes, I can. Hi. <laughs> Hello together. Hi, Hi. Yes. We will start in a few minutes, people showing up. Okay. Uh, we have a few signed up. Berent is there, I can see. And my brother-in-law was there. So some family members trying to see Gerald, trying to see Gerald from a distance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is, is the sound all right for you guys? Yes, yeah. loud and clear. All right, all right. We start in a few minutes. It's okay. not seven o'clock, so I try to be on a exact time schedule and to see how many people will join during the meeting uh, who were interested to join. So we okay. saw about 150 people reacted positively, but wow. finally to sign up at seven o'clock is maybe different. <laughs> yes, wait and see. Gerard, will it be good if we uh, close our cameras because then you have not so much files to send over the internet. So I think it will yeah. work at our. Yes, and I will start the meeting because if people have questions or what else, you can write better maybe a question than talking. It might okay. be, otherwise it might interrupt the Zoom data on the internet. Uh, thank you, Mark. I think yeah. it would be smart, okay. yes. Okay, okay. So, so microphone and uh, video off. Yes, yes, maybe that's the best thing. Yes. Unless you want to really say something, put your microphone on and you can come in between. But if 50 people do it, although I don't know how many will join today. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I'll we do. try it. We will try it. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Okay. So I still have my microphone on. You can see, uh, can't see me, but you can hear me, right? I can hear you. Perfect. So then I. I can I, mute you if you want. I can mute you. No, I will do by myself. That's not a problem. I can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I cannot mark mute. I can. I can imagine. He doesn't like that. <laughs> Uh, I think you can. <laughs> you can throw me out. <laughs> okay, so far we have five participants. I'll wait a few more minutes. Huh? I see Bernard is there, Marcel, Rene, Mark. So I yep. was expecting more people to join up, but we will see how it goes first. Dirk, Dirk and Moritz will join us. Are they on the way? Um, I, I'm, I'm home now. I just arrived <laughs> home, so I don't know what they, but we, we have talked about it and we said, okay, we, we have to yeah. see that. Yeah, all right, all right. Hey, 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 Mark, I can tell you at the end, I will uh, close the meeting that I will host another meeting for America, USA, mm -hmm. Canada, and, and, uh, and South America. Mm -hmm. Because okay. I, I will be in Brazil within a couple of weeks and then I'm on the same timeline. So that would be more easier for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Lou, Lou, Lou and Leslie asked me to do that. Oh, great. So we will did, see. There was, did, yeah. did Lou tell you about um, the new customer we have in, in America? No. No. Uh, it seems that we really got now the, the breakthrough, let's say. It's, it's right. uh, not 100%, but uh, Lou, tell me it's 100%, but you, you know me. <laughs> Before it is not written down, it's not 100% for me. So, yeah. but uh, it seems we, we really had a, a very yeah. good new contact, uh, and they, yeah. they they told us to start with the whole, um, um, yeah, not not the whole, but I think 80% of biofish food. So, we are very happy. Okay. With it's good to hear. Well, um, and then I'm anxious to do my, my Zoom meeting for the Americas. <laughs> I will give you a call maybe tomorrow, then uh, we can discuss yeah. that. Yes, okay. please, please. Uh, I will also need from Lou some ideas what mm -hmm. kind of direction we should go with the Zoom meeting, because this is the first one. And I start within, uh, within a few minutes. I will start, I think. Mm -hmm. For the guys who were on time, I prefer that the people who are on time are treated well. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Yeah, we'll sometimes start. it's a little bit complicated with these Zoom meetings. I can tell you we have this problem yeah. now with the... Uh, uh, um, the schooling of my kids okay. so, and they have to make uh, Zoom meetings in the morning and uh, yeah, one guy is, is doing Teams, the other is doing Zoom, the other is, uh, has to make a uh, big blue button and all yeah, different yeah. Types. and at the end nothing is working. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. I, I, I was training the last two days 
how to manage this thing here. And Bernd helped me a little bit yesterday to, to make the details working well. Well, we will start. But I will make a recording of it. So many people ask me, how are you going to record it so we can see it later on? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> then it's for those who are there. So there is, okay, there is uh, Dirk and Moritz. Okay, nice to see Germany online. Uh, Dirk and Moritz, you can uh, uh, mute your microphone and and also the camera, so we have enough uh, data going well on the internet. Is that okay? I don't know, if Dirk. Okay, Dirk, I think now we're hearing me. Dirk and Moritz. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we we'll just talk with Mark to to take off the. The video and uh, and muting the tele the microphone to have enough data, not scrambling our conference. Is okay. that okay? Yes, of course. Okay, we'll start. Okay, th thank you all for uh, joining the meeting. Uh, let me get me here the cell in here. Well, this is the first Zoom meeting for me, so I uh, will present some cases which were asked me to talk about uh, today on January 12th, because it's the first one I, uh, I might learn my lessons from this one, and your reactions uh, will be much appreciated after this first one. You first, you see behind me, you see where I'm sitting. I'm sitting on a great spot. I'm sitting on the Amazon. Now, you guess, I wish it was true. This was a couple of years ago, this time of the year, enjoying a, a beautiful trip on the Amazon. Well, this is my screen behind me. Well, Talking about fish health is talking about, well, explaining you that a medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. So all what we try to do in aquarium keeping is tell you is probability. We try. If we would have an exact science on fish, well, we need to use many more tools than we do these days. But anyway, I will do my best to give you a probability, probability of the possibilities of fish diseases. So questions have been posed to me and more questions can be put forward by the people attending this meeting. And maybe best is to send a message in the chat box. Uh, there's a chat box uh, available, so you should be able to do that. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is a question that was raised, well, I got very often this question, is my water quality is perfect. I do all the testing I can, I have available, the pH is great, the hardness, ammonia, everything, but my fish are still getting sick, so why? So this is a qu qu quite a lot of questions coming up to me like this. And well, the thing you have to be aware about, if your fish is sick for the hobbyist, is you have to be a detective, a detective for your fish and your aquarium, your equipment and everything. And that means, well, did you really check the parameters you test for? Because not all the parameters are, are, can be tested. Maybe you only test five, but there are about 50 or 60 parameters you can test. You know, there's a probability that it might be a lead poisoning or iron poisoning or too much copper or anything else in, in the fish tank. I, when I worked in Chicago in, in the, the 90s, sorry, in the 80s, talking about years ago, in the 80s, uh, we have a lot of copper issues because the people are having in Chicago a lot of old piping system, piping system from copper, old copper piping. And there was a major problem of copper poisoning. But people were checking their ammonia and the pH, everything was perfect, but the fish was dying of copper poisoning. So be aware that you only test limited parameters in our test kits and the aquarium hobby. The next thing when you have a sick fish is, well, you have to watch and to see the symptoms. That means look at the signs, look at the behavior. What do you see and communicate that with your aquarium shop, with your people around you on the internet or the aquarium clubs you're on online, you share a video and ask them, please tell me what's going on. So show, share videos about this. Some symptoms are typical. Another thing I can mention to you is, is feeding fish food can, can be a problem because a lot of frozen or live fish foods have high loads of microbes and parasites. Several studies have been done on that. And, and you have to be aware that, that uh, fish food can be a risk. 
So that's one part of my studies I did a lot on the fish food. And another factor when your fish can become sick is because it can be a stress factor. A stress factor, what stress? Well, can be aggressivity between the fish, can be uh, other things like uh, the fish is lacking hiding place, or the children are tapping all day on the, on the, on the front of the aquarium. Stress factors. Uh, for example, uh, in the morning it's dark in the living room, you put up bright lights and the fish are really stressed out by having a bright light. So, so be a detective for your fish in the aquarium. And then you can maybe find out what is wrong with your fish. But it's not easy. It's a lot of probability. So that was the first question. If anybody has a, well, the people attending here, we have seven participants, I see. If anybody has a question on this subject, you, if you want, you can put on the microphone and raise a question or on about the issue or write it in the chat, please. You, you can do that. Well, another question uh, that was raised to me recently, very recently, is someone who used a good medication against gill flukes. And he used a higher dosage than recommended, but the fish were still sick. Well, there is a good explanation for that. Is that when you treat for certain diseases like here against flukes, and here you see the amount of dosage you apply. This is the, 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 the how can I say, the, the time in minutes that the flukes were detached or dead, or dead. Black is detachment, and then the gray bar is that the flukes are dead. And you can see with a higher dosage, the higher you go, less flukes are going dead or less dying, and less flukes are detaching. That means a higher dosage does not mean you will be more likely to kill off the parasite. And that's not only for flukes. And that's luckily a, a lot of good of medications, like the ones from Aquarium Munster. They have very good indications on the leaflets how exactly to use the dosage. Because extra dosage in most cases do not help. It's the same thing for white spot disease or velvet disease or flukes. It's the same for uh, the hole in the head disease. People are using two to three grams metronidazole for, for four days. Well, this is killing fish because this is a toxic product when you use it at this high dosage. So just to tell you, please stick to the dosage that is recommended by the the producer, the manufacturer, or the seller of the product of the medication. So follow the instruction of the leaflet. Higher dosage does not mean you will kill more parasites. No, not at all. This is a case that was very well studied on gill flukes. Higher dosage did not kill, just in the contrary, they survived even better. Another question that was raised, uh, my fish are suffering from white spot disease. Ache. But it seems that the medication is not working. Well, that can happen. Of course, that you use a medication and it's not working. Um, I'm not going to discuss the kind of medications, but the first thing I want to see, you know, are you sure that it's a white spot you see? Because like on this is here, you see an encapsulated worm larvae, Metasecaria. This is a Liparinus from Colombia, from Bogota, and uh, from those rivers uh, in the Rio Negro, the Rio Amazonas, the fish, in many cases, have this kind of parasitic infections, which you cannot kill, you cannot get rid of, there is no medication for it, because it's very nice encapsulated, and no medication can penetrate in those encapsulated uh, worms. So, it's part of nature, and the fish will not die from it. They just not looking nice, but you cannot treat. But many people mistreat it and see it as a white spot. Odinium, in many cases, is the same thing. It's, it's regarded, some people, and it's a heavy odinium uh, infection, they see it as a, a white spot appearance. Well, it's gray and dusty. Well, usually a, a skin scraping, if you have a microscope, can help you to identify. But so, look, white spots are not always thick. And then on the other hand, if you have a medication, the normal medications you have for the normal white spot, here on the left, this is the normal 
if your theory is, now you might be able to cure this clown load where you act quickly enough on time, not waiting too long. There is a new kind of white spot, which is called the, the neo ichthyotherius And the neo ichthyotherius is, is a new kind, which is more resistant to the common treatments we have. You can see it sometimes very clearly on certain fish because it looks very large, smeary looking, more yellowish than this white one here on the, the regular uh, white spot disease. But this is uh, quite often mistreated. You have to try to identify this new white spot because you need to do a, a different treatment. Like the new treatment for this kind of is extra, just salt. This is the new one here on the right. Uh, it needs extra salt. The extra, that doesn't like salt, this kind of new white spot, the neo -ethyptyrus. And in a microscope, you, you can identify the difference. See, here is the, the regular Ichthyophtherius multifilius. You see the typical U-shaped nucleus. And here you see the neo ichthyotherius Schlotfeldi. You see the very strange looking nucleus, they're more darker and they look a little bit different. So it's something you have to take care about. And the other thing you can do as actions when you, you're dealing with this kind of, uh, how can I say, white spot uh, disease. Let's see if I can uh, get the screen here, correct here, so we can see it more clearly. Uh, that the temperature, raising the temperature, can, can help you to, to speed up the cycle of the parasite. The parasite has a cycle for about seven to 10 days, depending on the temperature where it's living in. And the higher the temperature you raise it, the more quicker the cycle will go, and the more easy you can kill off this baby here. Here's the tomite. And that's the one you can kill with medications like Phanomore and Protomore. You also can kill the neo then with adding salt to it. You can use a microfiltration, smaller than 300. You can use a UV lamp, which kills the parasite, particularly for centralized systems, important. Siphoning off the bottom of the aquarium. That helps to get rid of the parasite. It's a physical action, leaving 24 hours of light on because the parasite only reproduces at night. So he falls on the bottom and remains there until the light goes off, it goes dark. So he leaves the light on, the parasites fall off and the light is on, you can siphon off from the bottom. So if you siphon off a couple of times a day, you can physically remove white spots and particularly in severe infections, you can uh, el eliminate uh, can, you can eliminate it. So, so let's see what I can see on my screen here. Okay, I ah, see other people attending. Thank you for more attending here to the presentation. Okay, let's see here. So uh, that was about the white spot disease. Uh, same for a while I can talk about the marine egg. Uh, this was like a, the marine egg. It's the same way you can handle it with different physical actions. You can take on the, the, the new egg system, which we, we recommend to use. So, so there are many actions you can do. And at the same time, well, I didn't explain it yet, but uh, feeding the biofish food matrine, because the matrine helps that the fish, when he eats the matrine, that he expels the parasite, that means at the mucus changes and the parasite drops off and the new born baby parasite does not reinfect the fish. So at that moment, you have an opportunity that the fish can be defending himself against these uh, kind of parasitic infections. So this is uh, the combination of a treatment and the combination of the biofish food metry helps you that the fish uh, can have multiple choices of defense that you can help with your actions by the filtration, the siphoning, the light, raising the temperature. Particularly raising the temperature is something really helpful in, uh, in speeding up a parasitic cycle. So the quicker the cycle goes. So that's why it's so difficult to treat uh, uh, cold water fish and cold water when they have white spot disease because the cycle takes about two to three weeks. So it's something to think about. Okay, let's see what we have.
have here. All right, so we here, here. Uh, next question. Well, something new which I came across by, by talking to people working uh, in aquaculture, it's about thermotherapy. Thermotherapy is a new way to stimulate innate immune system of all animals who live in temperature controlled conditions. Of course, our fish are cold water or cold pilotherm species. That means they adapt to the temperature of the environment. But that helps. You know, we know from mankind that thermotherapy can help to cure, see, the, because the heat can help to turn on your immune system, but also for the fish. Uh, we know that, like Hippocrates stated that 2,000 years ago, that those who cannot be cured by medicine can be cured by surgery. But those who cannot be cured by surgery can be cured by fire. That's hypothermia. That's an old trick of, of, of curing people, giving uh, a temperature raise. And the hypothermia is, is related for humans for uh, protein activation, uh, for body enzyme activation for humans, and, and uh, to control allergic symptoms. And when the body temperature, for instance, for humans, uh, increases one degree, and they, they use it, you know, for instance, now we in Corona times, let's talk about it, Corona times, a lot of doctors use this term hypothermia to stimulate the immune system for people who are suffering in the immune system, because with one degree, uh, uh, one degree dropping of temperature of the body, the 36% immune system declines. If decreasing temperature has a bad impact on the basic metabolism and on enzyme activities. So every raise of temperature uh, people learned, it can help you to stimulate your immune system. The disadvantage of a uh, stimulating immune system in aquaria is when you have a higher uh, temperature, you have 30 degrees Celsius, 20 or 10, we have more toxic ammonia risk, particularly in higher pH water. Or higher temperature has less oxygen in the water. So something to think about, uh, it can help your fish to stimulate the immune system, to stimulate the physiology. Some people in aquaculture use it, particularly people dealing with koi and goldfish, fancy goldfish, uh, the orandas. If you keep them at room temperature 80, 90, 20 degrees, and the fish seems to suffer, we have seen very good cases when you just low, higher or speeding up the temperature or raising the temperature to 22 degrees, really help the fancy goldfish to do better to eat better and to stimulate your immune system. So this is an example which we we'll learn about more in, in the near future. So are there any more questions for, for you people uh, attending uh, the meeting? I don't know if you are, uh, let's see if, if you have the, the chat room here somewhere. Okay, well, Rene, thank you for your question. What is the best doses for metronidazole? Well, I learned by, by people in aquaculture that the maximum dose you can use is 0.8 grams or 800 milligrams to 100 milliliter. If you go higher, if you go to one gram of metronidazole, you can have a risk of uh, poisoning your fish or having causing some pathological damage. It's overdosing. So the, you can go easily 0.6 to 0.8 grams by 100 liters for two days. So 0.6 for, is okay too. What do you say, Rene? 0.6 is okay too if you go. Yes, 0.6. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the, the, yeah. yeah. It, it's it's usually 0.6 is about the average people use, but a lot of people use many more. And then yeah. they say, well, the spironucleus is not killed, which is the parasite you want to kill. But I uh, I tell you, we had many. People are having really bad problems. And not only the parasites were not killed, but they became also resistant. <laughs> yeah, I've done so, it really wrong in the past. <laughs> I don't know. This is something spread on, on the internet because uh, recently somebody called me and said, uh, now I used four grams. They say, what? Yeah, and the fish are still sick. Oh, yes. Well. <laughs> yeah, you Google it and you get two grams per, uh, per uh, yeah. Yeah. 
two grams. Yeah, four two, days two, treatment. Two, two. Correct, and correct. then and then use charcoal filtration. Why not changing the water, which yeah. is the best treatment? Change your water, get rid of all the, the shit in the water and yeah. refresh the water. Uh, well well this is the internet. Probably that's that's one of the problems you have to deal with that. Um, on social media, on the internet, uh, people share their their thoughts and information yeah. to help to control fish, but it's sometimes uh, too bad. It's a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Well, I see here a question uh, oh, from Eleni. Good evening, Eleni. I'm sorry, Eleni, it's in English tonight, but I will do it soon in Dutch for you, for you and your, your friends. Well, uh, what is a good medicine for flukes? Um, well, this depends if it's gill or skin flukes. Uh, it, this is a, a problem because a good medicine is depending on the history of the flukes. If a fluke has been treated very often with uh, certain products like levamizole, mebendazole, uh, prazicantel, there seems to become a, a resistance. You know, currently uh, in, in the experience I deal with people caring for their fish. Uh, is Prasicantel one of the best solutions? Unfortunately, it's not common uh, available anymore uh, by the, the common supplier of fish medications. And luckily, according Munster came out with a new one, which is the the the, the Bactimore, Bactimore Plus, I guess. Yeah, that's the name of it, which is a different kind of it's kind of chemical that disinfects the fish and, and, and kills the flukes in a certain way, on a gentle way. Uh, we would have preferred Prasicatel to be staying on the market, but unfortunately, that that Prasicatel is taken off by Europe, and it is not allowed to be spread without prescription. You still can get it uh, by prescription through the veterinarian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Dr. More Forte. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, Dirk. Oh yeah, I'm see, I'm getting older, getting getting slowly out of the industry. <laughs> All right, well. For, Eleni, well, you use Argumor. Well, uh, well, Argumor sometimes works because Argumor kills the skeleton of the fluke. So uh, and it might take longer to work. So uh, Argumor, some people have good luck, some people don't. So that's why we recommend for the flus, use the Dactimor uh, Forte. Uh, that is better. And, and that would, I would recommend to use that instead of the Argumor. So that, that hopefully explains you uh, the difference uh, in, in the question you, you brought forward. Is that okay? Well, the difference, yeah. Well, uh, active ingredients. Thank you, Mark. There we go. Dactimor Forte is Ciromazine, which has been used many years ago in the in United States. It's been well known. And I've tested it in the laboratory, and in the beginning, I thought it was not working. But in the long run, I have to be patient. It, uh, it, it kills off the flukes. Oh, thank you. Nikki. Oh, goeie avond, Nikki. Nikki, wie is daar? Goeie avond, Nikki. Ben blij dat je er bent. Thank you, Nikki, for being there. You have a large group of attendees. Next time, I should do a Zoom meeting for your group of people. In Dutch for you, I will some the Netherlands do. Well, what is a good medication common on the market for bacterial infections? I wish it was easy to explain for you, uh, Nikki, because it depends on the bacteria. There are so many kinds of bacteria, and if for humans, you know, if we use uh, bacterial treatment for humans, we try first to send the sample to the laboratory to check what kind of bacteria do we have, uh, what kind of antibiotic is tested in the laboratory can work. Of course, we cannot do that for fish. We have no time. We have to act rapidly. Uh, used to be antibiotics used to be the best. But slowly, we are changing our, 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 our opportunities to use a kind of uh, disinfectants. You know, we have uh, disinfectants on the market which cleans the fish from the bacteria. Maybe it's not so efficient, but it all depends on the moment when you start, uh, how can I say, uh, and when you start treating the bacteria. You do it in the beginning, uh, you, you, you might have uh, very good success with the products from 
uh, Aquarium Munster. I'm just thinking on, on the name of it now. Uh, hey, Mark, Tim, correct me the name of uh, your antibacterial product which we, we tested for, uh, for Aquarium Munster, you know? Uh, like Bactopur is not always working uh, anymore. I know it's it's Bactopur is, is a very simple simple product. You know it's uh, Viromor. That it is. It's called Viromor because it cleans the fish from viruses and bacteria. It's a kind of a very good uh, disinfectant. Uh, so uh, uh, I will do. It. I would recommend to try that out. But important that you treat as soon as possible against the bacteria. If you wait too long, the fish are too much damaged. And Viromor particularly helps in the beginning stages when the bacteria, particularly in the outside, the gills, uh, the fins, has a very good impact. Internally, it's more difficult. You should try to work with our biofish food, you know, the, like the biofish food we have, the fuko, the grapefruit seed extract, moringa, or the garlic. Those are a few that we, we, we recommend for helping the fish during a bacterial treatment next to a medical treatment. So I wish it was easy to answer bacterial effect. It's, it's a trial and error. Like I said at the beginning, a lot of trial we do in our hobby is, 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 a, is a probability. We try and we learn from the experience. So Eleni, I hope uh, this uh, answered uh, some of your questions uh, on, the, on the bacterial infection. Well, on the other hand, yes, yeah, something else, bacterial infection. Let the people check very well the, the water quality. Usually it happens that, uh, that the, uh, the water quality is, is not correct by the people or they're food, feeding the wrong food, which is maybe kept in the, in the refrigerator for five days and is contaminated with bacteria or it's spoiled. So it's good to know the reasons why the fish get bacterial infection. So. Okay, Eleni, you're using uh, the Basilea Professional. Well, uh, the, the professional is made for the professionals because the professional is made during my experience uh, as an importer to treat my fish during the acclimation process and during the time they were in my fish house. Like you have, Eleni, you have your fish in your fish house. And you can use it on your own fish and you can use it for at least uh, the professional care you can use permanently. You can use that permanently or at least two to three weeks. And the professional treat, you can use in a case when you have uh, uh, a chance when you're encountering a disease, bacterial or a viral or something you don't know. So the professional treat is a general uh, treatment. Uh, yeah, you can use that maybe uh, every month, one week as a, as a preventative. So try it. Let me know, Eleni, uh, how it works for you. Okay. I hope that sounds right for you. Okay. Thanks, Eleni. Okay. Well, I will see if there are more uh, questions coming. We have uh, eight participants now, but uh, I I hope I'm recording it here because people ask me. So well, uh, I will continue a little bit more on my on my presentation. Uh, and then we'll see if more questions will come up. I hope I answered it all. Otherwise not, I will see what comes up later on. Um, well, I always tell the people, you know, study in the books. I have several books available. Uh, go to my YouTube channel. Uh, people who want to get training, go to my new Patreon channel. You know, there's things that can help you. Uh, here are the links I can provide to you so you can uh, see them on my videos, which I explain a lot on fish diseases in four languages. So German, Dutch, English, and French. So not a, it's available, many of our lectures are available in Brazil, but it's only available in Portuguese at the university in Natal for the training of the students. So, uh, well, there's a training now I offer in my Patreon, so there's also opportunities for people who want to learn more. Well, the next uh, Zoom meeting uh, will plan uh, will be for the USA, Canada, and South America time. Uh, contact the US branch, according to Münster. I will schedule a meeting with them, and they will inform their American and Canadian customers, and I will inform 
the people do Facebook. So this is the next to come, probably within a couple of weeks. Something else I can continue to talk about, we have uh, another half an hour left, unless more questions come up, is about uh, the cause and prevention of uh, fish diseases. You know, if, if you want to teach to become a, a fish detective, is learn to investigate for the causes of the problems of your fish before you start medicating these. People who know me and see my presentation, they know I'm very keen on telling you, look, on the reasons why your fish are getting sick. Don't go looking where your puppy is lost if you didn't check properly. Well, the lady found it out too late for me. But the summary of cause of prevention, you know, is, is, is that uh, I will talk about shortly is there's are certain causes. Water quality is one of the most important to test people who deal with fish every day who are making medications, who are making fish food like Rene, they know that water quality is the first thing we have to check. Uh, check acclimation and quarantine procedures, check fish food and the immune system of the fish, things you can work on. You can work on biosecurity and fish health. So, and fish health management. These are all things in a summary, which can talk all about fish disease and causes. Well, of course, proper identification. That is the most important thing we have to learn. And it's the best way is to learn to use a microscope. Our goal is always to keep healthy fish. Here is uh, pretty healthy guppies, very great guppies. They came in from Sri Lanka to an importer in Europe where I work for every month. And why are those guppies healthy? Well, it starts because the breeder did proper care of it. Good breeding, good selection, then good packing procedures, good shipping, good unpacking. Uh, well, first of all, Good transport by the airlines, which is sometimes a very delicate problem because usually the fish are traveling for approximately 24 to 48 hours. So this can be a risk for the health of these fish. Also, good acclimation procedures with quarantine, using your proper medications depending on the species, depending on the history of that guppy, and, and a good filtration system changing water, all those things are factors that help together for, for these fish to be in perfect condition. Because if you also learn to look at fish, you can see these fish behave very healthy. They're coming to look for food, they're coming up to you when you're passing by. So this is a good indicator of a healthy fish. But the origin of fish diseases, which I explain a lot in my, in my classes, is the combination of stress Stress can be bad water quality, can be uh, stressed by physical stress, netting, wrong netting, uh, can be stressed by too much light, for instance, and microbes which are available in the environment or in the food and the fish. So that's the origin is a mix of problems, a mix of causes. And the introduction of the pathogen can be coming in already by uh, poor acclimation procedures. When you adding water to the aquaria, newly introduced fish, or mixing fish from different breeders, or wild or different tanks, that could carry diseases. So introduction of pathogens can be from different sources. For the home aquarium, it's sometimes a new fish that's without any quarantine procedure comes in your home tank. And it can bring in the disease, which the old fish in the existing aquarium has never seen before. So it can introduce a disease. So new will introduce this, and therefore you have to be careful when you start mixing fish because they can carry diseases. Feeding food uh, that is contaminated with pathogens, particularly the people who are, are feeding uh, live food, know that they, if they just collect food from the wild, from the rivers, that they can introduce pathogens. Uh, I, I know from a, a, a fish farmer who is breeding clownfish and, and many other marine fish, when he gets his phytoplankton in, or when he gets his artemia eggs in, he has to disinfect them because they are carriers of Vibrio. And Vibrio is very pathogenic, a very risk for disease for marine aquaculture, and particularly for people breeding clownfish and other uh, fish in, in warm water aquaria. So, 
even the Artemia X coming out of the cans were carrying Vibrio. So he had to disinfect the Artemia X before he could give it uh, to his clownfish. So it, this food can be a risk. So always by, by food, you know, I, I can add to it. Make sure your food is well cooked, well heated, well disinfected, or like I say, I'm the biofish food man, you know, give granulated food because that's cooked and prepared and, and cleaned of any pathogens. That's why aquaculture is feeding 99% with granulated food because it's safe. Another risk of disease is not eliminating dead or dying fish. You should know when a fish is dying in an aquarium that before he dies that all the pathogens particularly the parasites, escape from the dying fish and it goes looking for new hosts. And that's his friends, his brothers and sisters in the aquarium. That's his, he's gonna at, be attacked by the leftover parasites from the dying fish. And a dead fish should be eliminated because even also dead fish is eating by his counterparts. And when it's eating, the fish can also eat the pathogens, the bacteria, particularly mycobacterium is a risk of spreading like this. Another risk of uh, introduction of pathogens is introduction of contaminated water. I've known cases by marine fish wholesalers who were collecting the marine water from the ocean, bringing in diseases because they were not disinfecting the water properly. Now everybody knows they have to use UV or other sterilization techniques to get rid of possible microbes or uh, parasites in, in the contaminated water. I've seen it at ponds who are getting the water from rivers because it's cheap. I've seen it in China where a lot of diseases came into the ponds. I've seen it in Brazil because it's cheap to get water from the rivers, but it's bringing in also parasites or the risk of parasites or bacteria. So all things to watch and to be careful. So this is all a lack of biosecurity because all this can be prevented if you follow by secure rules. Another problem I would like to discuss is that so many people have problems with their aquaria for two main reasons. Dirty filters. Poorly maintained dirty filters which do not work properly. Don't tell me these are bacteria because this pet shop who showed me this tag, he told me, oh, I cannot remove this dirty thing here because those are all my good bacteria. I told them there is no living bacteria living in that dirt. This is just leftovers should be eliminated because this sponge is polluted with dirt. And where there is dirt that cannot be eaten by the bacteria, there is no bacteria living. So you have to clean the sponge and get rid of the problem. The reason I was here in this pet shop because he had dying fish. As soon as he had 50 guppies in this fish tank, he was losing 10 guppies in the next 24 hours. He only could keep 30 or 40 guppies in the tank. 50 was too much because the filter was not working properly. It was too dirty. You have to clean the filter properly. It's washing it out regularly and best to do it with the tank water. Maintenance is very important. Here, another fish tank in another pet shop I was giving advice. This was a big tank with a very tiny, small filter. Well, it's the same thing as a big truck running with a small engine from a small sea, from a small motorcycle. How can an engine work well from a, a big truck with an engine from a motorcycle? Well, this is an aquarium with a very tiny pump filtration. You only can keep very few fish. A few people who are introducing too many fish and these kind of aquaria have problems. The fish die. The other fish will do maybe well, but they can be getting a risk of bacterial infections, for example, because the water is not properly filtered. So if you have problems, if you have a shop or you have people talking about the problems, ask them about the filter. Is it clean properly or is it big enough? I always recommend everybody install a filter as big as you can. It's the best investment you can make is in a good filtration. Sometimes we have diseased fish. People tell me, show me a picture and send me this picture. Oh, my fish is dying. 
Well, I asked, did you check the water? Oh, no, I didn't check the fish was dying. Well, this fish was dying of ammonia poisoning. That was the reason, the cause of the bacteria outbreak of this fish. The fish started to bleed because it was just weakened and exhausted. And the bacteria attacked. Why? And then the people try to put medication in the water when the water has a high ammonia content. What happens? Ammonia and together with medication, it's even worse. The fish are much quicker dead and then they blame it on the medication. No, it's the ammonia poisoning they didn't get rid of. And what happens with that those kind of fish? Well, those kind of fish have usually secondary bacterial factors in the gill and that's why they die. Usually after stress, after poisoning, those gills, like here on the right, it's completely damaged. You know, they have like a pneumonia, have a lung infection, a gill infection, and the fish will die. Here it starts like this, a few parts here. And this is just on a small magnification. You can see this uh, on 50 to 100. You can see already damaged gills, and it tells you something damaged the gills. And it's usually, most cases, why our fish will die in our aquaria. And because also they're getting secondary bacterial infections after parasitic or after stress by bad water quality. So fish diseases of wild and tank raised fish. Well, you have to understand when you work with tank raised fish or wild fish, that there is a difference. Do not mix them. It's the same for koi farmers, you know. Don't mix koi from Israel and Japan, unless you know they're being well treated or well taken care of, but don't mix fish from different origins. And here particularly is mixing uh, fish from the wild and the tank raised, because the, the tank raised fish usually have specific diseases because the breeder is breeding fish, but also breeding diseases. This is part of aquaculture. Uh, they have more resistant packages. Why? Because they use more of the medications. Luckily, they have more financial investments, so they try to use many more medications than anybody else can do, and they try to use other systems. In the wild fish, there is less control. There are more different diseases, and there's less resistant pathogens. But of course, you have then those kind of crazy worm infections, like in, this is a nematode, in this capsulated in this ruby nose. So, but there's less resistance. But unfortunately, there's less financial investment in the wild fish. So there's more risk of a disease. So, but to give you an idea, never mix the fish. It's very important for many exporters or for wild fish. And that's particularly here in a, in a fish exporting station in Kenya. When they receive the fish here from the fishermen, they came here from the boat, uh, from the, uh, from the ocean, and here is the canadine station, and here is the, the biologist, the fish doctor, who is giving the, the fish a proper disinfection treatment with methylene blue, fresh water dips and everything. She puts them in the fish tank for 24, 48 hours, and she uses a canadine treatment, a treatment with against parasites and bacteria, depending on the kind of fish and her experience, what she find out. So this is the procedure properly disinfecting and conditioning marine fish. Another thing is food fight is cruelty. We love about this. Oh, we like this. Oh, this is funny. The child is playing games with the dog. No, they are fighting for the food. Well, if you see this in the aquarium, we, we laugh about it, you know, we like it, you know, look at the goldfish is eating the food and now the other fish trying to have a part of it, a piece of it. But look at the dominant chiclet, the angelfish. There he goes, he goes away and takes the relic and nobody else can have it. Well, a food fight can be cruelty. That's why I, I'm not a pro of, of feeding tablets in the water. Well, everybody knows my idea about it when you see my videos on YouTube. Also, bad foods can be a risk of containing pathogens. Here, like a mycobacterial infection, is quite often a problem in dwarf cichlids. You know, they get some fatty, greasy growths here on the on the, the pectoral fins. They get swollen bellies. They die, uh, and they have internal massive mycobacterial infection. And usually, this came this apistograma 
this came particularly from feeding mosquito larvae because most of the mosquito larvae which are not properly taken care of contain mycobacterium uh, bacteria mycobacteria a risk of fish tuberculosis or this wild fish Cynodontus decorus from the congo very easy infected with uh, parasitic worms and starvation and this is a typical problem for wild fish worms so that and it is coming from the food from the river because it's containing worms so why should we strengthen the immune system of the fish some other ideas about how helping the fish because we, we can have an impact of that is is that the fish is able to protect itself from a virus a bacteria fungi an immune system is very important we know it from humans also during the corona epidemic now that the immune system is very important and then when it's weakened a minimum amount can already be uh, lethal and have lethal consequences for for fish and mankind and any living organism so when the immune system works efficiently you can prevent infections and prevent medications some other thing i want to mention about the, the cause of diseases is the risk of spreading risk of spreading diseases is typically here there's a fish farm in malaysia look all the fish nets all together different fish pieces in one pump of water or here selecting fish all in the same water well this is typical areas where i work and consult i say you cannot do that and one net one net to go around to collect the fish while you're spreading diseases him you're spreading diseases you are spreading diseases this is a very big shop i visited and there's only three nets four nets to pick fish from all these different tanks well this is a risk when there's a white spot infection here you bring it to this tank or to this tank fish nets fish nets are the number one spread of diseases so take care of fish nets that you disinfect or you put one net to a tank so this is about what i want to explain you uh, about some causes of fish diseases in short uh, study the books subscribe to my youtube channel get training on my patreon and well get some information on my books on my videos uh, let, let's see if you if you have any more questions on that uh, i can try to help you if uh, something comes up uh, here let's see wait for my chat here let's see here we go into the chat room but let's see where is the first i can get here somewhere here okay let's see can the filter be too big has that any kind of bad influence on the tank no a filter can never be too big Nikki, very good question the only thing that can be too big is the water flow is the water flow i have very beautiful videos on that if you want that for your customers Nikki, i have very beautiful videos where fish getting sick 